You are listening to the Auditory Entertainment's production of Black Amazon of Mars by Leigh Brackett. Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson. Part 5. Conclusion. Swiftly, silently, those of the ice folk who had borne the captives into the city came up from behind, where they had stood withdrawn and waiting. And one of them bore a crystal rod, like a scepter, with a spark of ugly purple burning in the globed end. Stark leaped to put himself between them and Kyra. He struck out, raging, and because he was almost as quick as they, he caught one of the slim, luminous bodies between his hands. The utter coldness of that alien flesh burned his hands as frost will burn. Even so, he clung on, snarling and saw the tendrils writhe and stiffen as though in pain. Then, from the crystal rod, a thread of darkness spun itself to touch his brain with silence and the cold that lies between the worlds. He had no memory of being carried once more through the shimmering streets of that elfin, evil city, back to the stupendous well of the outer tower, and up along the spiral path of ice that soared those dizzy hundreds of feet from bedrock to the glooming crystal globe. But when he again opened his eyes, he was lying on the wide stone ledge at ice level. Beside him was the arch that led outside. Close above his head was the control bank that he had seen before. Kyra and Balin were there also, on the ledge. They leaned stiffly against the stone wall beside the control bank and facing them was a squat, round mechanism, from which projected a sort of wheel of crystal rods. Their bodies were strangely rigid, but their eyes and minds were awake, terribly awake. Stark saw their eyes, and his heart turned within him. Kyra looked at him. She could not speak, but she had no need to. She had not feared the swordmen of Kashat. She had not feared her red wolves when he unmasked her in the square. She was afraid now, but she warned him, ordered him not to save her. They cannot force you, Stark. Don't let them. And Balin, too, pleaded with him for Kashad. They were not alone on the ledge. The ice folk clustered there, and out upon the flying spiral pathway. On the narrow bridges and the spans of fragile ice, they stood in hundreds, watching. Eyeless, faceless, their bodies drawn in rainbow lines across the dimness of the shaft. Stark's mind could hear all the silent edges of their laughter, secret, knowing laughter, full of evil, full of triumph, and Stark was filled with a corroding terror. He tried to move, to crawl towards Kyra, standing like a carven image in her black mail. He could not. Again her fierce, proud glance met his, and the silent laughter of the ice folk echoed in his mind. And he thought it very strange that in this moment, now, he should realize that there had never been another woman like her on all of the worlds of the sun. The fear she felt was not for herself. It was for him. Apart from the multitudes of the ice folk, the group of seven stood upon the ledge, and now their thought voice spoke to Stark, saying, Look about you. Behold the men who have come before you through the gates of death. Stark raised his eyes to where their slender fingers pointed, and saw the icy galleries around the tower, saw more clearly the icy statues in them he had only glimpsed before. Men set like images in the galleries, men whose bodies were sheathed in a glittering mail of ice, sealing them forever. Warriors, nobles, fanatics, and thieves. The wanderers of a million years who had dared to enter this forbidden valley, and it remained forever. He saw their faces, their tortured eyes wide open, their features frozen in the agony of a slow, an awful death. They refused us, 
the seven whispered. They would not take away the sword. And so they died, as this woman and this man will die, unless you choose to save them. We will show you, human, how they died. One of the ice folk bent and touched the squat round mechanism that faced Balin and Kyra. Another shifted the pattern of the control on the master bank. The wheel of crystal rods on the squat mechanism began to turn. The rods blurred, became a disk that spun faster and faster. High above, in the top of the tower, the great globe brooded, shrouded in its cloud of shimmering darkness. The disk became a whirling blur. The glooming shadow of the globe deepened, coalesced. It began to lengthen and descend, stretching itself down toward the spinning disk. The crystal rods of the mechanism drank the shadow in, and out of that spinning blur there came a subtle weaving of threads of darkness, a gossamer curtain winding around Kyra and Balin so that their outlines grew ghostly and the pallor of their flesh was as the pallor of snow at night. And still, Stark could not move. The veil of darkness began to sparkle faintly. Stark watched it, watched the chill motes brighten, watched the tracery of frost whiten over Kyra's mail, touch Balin's dark hair with silver. Frost. Bright, sparkling, beautiful, a halo of frost around their bodies a dust of splintered diamonds across their faces, an aurora of brittle light to crown their heads, frost, flesh slowly hardening into marbly whiteness as the cold slowly increased, and yet their eyes still lived and saw and understood. The thought voice of the seven spoke again. You have only minutes now to decide. Their bodies cannot endure too much and live again. Behold their eyes and how they suffer. Only minutes, human. Take away the sword of Ben Karak. Open for us the gates of death, and we will release these two alive. Stark felt again the flashing stab of pain across his nerves as one of the shining creatures moved behind him. Life and feeling came back into his limbs. He struggled to his feet. The hundreds of the ice folk on the bridges and galleries watched him in eager silence. He did not look at them. His eyes were on Kyra's, and now her eyes pleaded. Don't, Stark, don't barter the life of the Norlands for me. The thought voice beat at Stark, cutting into his mind with cruel urgency. Hurry, human. They are already beginning to die. Take away the sword and let them live. Stark turned. He cried out in a voice that made the icy bridges tremble. I will take the sword. He staggered out then, out through the archway. Across the glowing ice of the valley, Stark went at a stumbling run that grew swifter and more sure as his cold, numbed body began to regain its functions. And behind him, pouring out of the tower to watch, came the Shining Ones. They followed after him, gliding lightly. He could sense their excitement, the cold, strange ecstasy of triumph. He knew that already they were thinking of the great towers of stone rising again above the Norlands. The crystal cities, still and beautiful under the ice, all vestige of the ugly citadels of man, gone and forgotten. The seven spoke once more, a warning. If you turn toward us with the sword, the woman and the man will die, and you will die as well, for neither you nor any other can now use the sword as a weapon of offense. Stark ran on. He was thinking then only of Kyra, with the frost crystals gleaming on her marble flesh and her eyes full of mute torment. The cairn loomed up ahead, dark and high, 
It seemed to Stark that the brooding figure of Ban Kruak watched him coming with those shadowed eyes beneath the rusty helm. The great sword blazed between those dead, frosted hands. The ice folk had slowed their forward rush. They stopped and waited, well back from the cairn. Stark reached the edge of the tumbled rock. He felt the first warm flare of the force waves in his blood, and slowly the chill began to creep out from his bones. He climbed, scrambling upward over the rough stones of the cairn. Abruptly then, at Ban Kruak's feet, he slipped and fell. For a second, it seemed that he could not move. His back was turned towards the ice folk. His body was bent forward, and shielded so. His hands worked with feverish speed. From his cloak, he tore a strip of cloth. From the iron boss, he took the glittering lens, the talisman of Ban Kruak. Stark laid the lens against his brow and bound it on. The remembered shock, the flood and sweep of memories that were not his own, the mind of Ban Kruak thundering his warning, its hard-won knowledge of an ancient, epic war. He opened his own mind wide to receive those memories. Before he had fought against them, now he knew that they were his one small chance in this swift gamble with death. Two things only of his own he kept firm in that staggering tide of another man's memories. Two names, Kyra and Balin. He rose up again, and now his face had a strange look, a curious duality. The features had not changed, but somehow the lines of the flesh had altered subtly, so that it was almost as though the old unconquerable king himself had risen again in battle. He mounted the last step or two, and stood before Ban Kruak. A shudder ran through him, a sort of gathering and settling of the flesh, as though Stark's being had accepted the stranger within it. His eyes, cold and pale as the very ice that sheathed the valley, burned with a cruel light. He reached and took the sword out of the frozen hands of Ban Kruak, as though it were his own. He knew the secret of the metal rings that bound its hilt below the ball of crystal. The savage throb of the invisible radiation beat in his quickening flesh. He was warm again, his blood running swiftly, his muscles sure and strong. He touched the rings and turned them. The fan-shaped aura of force that had closed the gates of death narrowed in, and as it narrowed, it leapt up from the blade of the sword in a tongue of pale fire, faintly shimmering, made visible now by the full focus of its strength. Stark felt the wave of horror bursting from the minds of the ice folk as they perceived what he had done, and he laughed. His bitter laughter rang harsh across the valley as he turned to face them, and he heard in his brain the shuddering, silent shriek that went up from all that gathered company. Ben Karak has returned! They had touched his mind. They knew. He laughed again, and swept the sword in a flashing arc, and watched the long bright blade of force strike out, more terrible than steel, against the rainbow bodies of the Shining Ones. They fell. Like flowers under a scythe, they fell. And all across the ice, the ones who were yet untouched turned out in their hundreds and fled back towards the tower. Stark came leaping down the cairn, the talisman of Ban Kruak bound upon his brow, the sword of Ban Kruak blazing in his hand. He swung that awful blade as he ran. The force beam that sprang from it cut through the press of creatures fleeing before him, hampered by their own numbers as they crowded back through the archway. He had only a few short seconds to do what he had to do. Rushing with great strides across the ice, spurning the withered bodies of the dead. And then, from the glooming darkness that hovered around the Tower of Stone, the black, cold beam struck down. Like a coiling whip it lashed him. The deadly numbness invaded the cells of his flesh, ached in the marrow of his bones, 
The bright force of the sword battled the chill invaders, and a corrosive agony tore at Stark's inner body, where the antipathetic radiations raged war. His steps faltered. He gave one hoarse cry of pain, and then his limbs failed, and he went heavily to his knees. Instinct only made him cling to the sword. Waves of blinding anguish racked him. The coiling lash of darkness encircled him, and its touch was the abysmal cold of outer space, striking deep into his heart. Hold the sword close. Hold it closer like a shield. The pain is great, but I will not die unless I drop the sword. Ban Kruak the Mighty had fought this before. Stark raised the sword again, close against his body. The fierce pulse of its brightness drove back the cold. Not far, for the freezing touch was very strong, but far enough so that he could raise again and stagger on. The dark force of the tower writhed and licked about him. He could not escape it. He slashed it in a blind fury with the blazing sword, and where the forces met, a flicker of lightning leaped in the air but it would not be beaten back. He screamed at it, a raging cat cry that was all stark, all primitive fury, at the necessity of pain. And he forced himself to run, to drag his tortured body faster across the ice. Because Kyra is dying. Because the dark cold wants me to stop. The ice folk jammed and surged against the archway. In a panic hurry, to take refuge far below in their many-leveled city. He raged at them, too. They were part of the cold, part of the pain. Because of them, Kyra and Balin were dying. He sent the blade of force lancing among them, his hatred rising full tide to join the hatred of Ban Kruak that lodged in his mind. Stab and cut and slash with a terrible beam of brightness. They fell and fell the hideous Shining Folk, and Stark sent the light of Ban Kruok's weapon sweeping through the tower itself, through the openings that were like windows in the stone. Again and again, stabbing through those open slits as he ran, and suddenly the dark beam of force ceased to move. He tore out of it, and it did not follow him, remaining stationary as though fastened to the ice. The battle of forces left his flesh. The pain was gone. He sped on to the tower. He was close now. The withered bodies lay in heaps before the arch. The last of the ice folk had forced their way inside. Holding the sword level like a lance, Stark leaped in through the arch, into the tower. The Shining Ones were dead where the destroying warmth had touched them. The flying spiral ribbons of ice were swept clean of them the arching bridges, and the galleries of that upper part of the tower. They were dead along the ledge, under the control bank. They were dead across the mechanism that spun the frosty doom around Kyra and Balin. The whirling disk still hummed. Below in that stupendous well, the crowding ice folk made a seething pattern of color on the narrow ways. But Stark turned his back on them and ran along the ledge. And in him was the heavy knowledge that he had come too late. The frost had thickened around Kyra and Balin. It encrusted them like a stiffened lace, and now their flesh was overlaid with a diamond shell of ice. Surely they could not live. He raised the sword to smite down at the whirling disc, to smash it, but there was no need. When the full force of that concentrated beam struck it, meeting the focus of shadow that it held, there was a violent flare of light and a shattering of crystal. The mechanism was silent. The glooming veil was gone from around the ice-shelled man and woman. Stark forgot the creatures in the shaft below him. He turned the blazing sword full upon Kyra and Balin. It would not affect the thin covering of ice. If the woman and the man were dead, it would not affect their flesh, any more than it had Ban Kruok's. But if they lived, if there was still a spark, a flicker beneath that frozen mail, the radiation would touch their blood with warmth. 
start again the pulse of life in their bodies. He waited, watching Kyra's face. It was still as marble. Something, instinct, or the warning mind of Ban Kruak that had learned a million years ago to beware of creatures of the ice, made him glance behind him. Stealthily, swift, and silent, up the winding ways they came. They had guessed that he had forgotten them in his anxiety. The sword was turned away from them now, and if they could take him from behind, stun him with the chill force of the scepter-like rods they carried? He slashed at them with the sword. He saw the flickering beam go down and down the shaft, saw the bodies fall like drops of rain, rebounding here and there from the flying spans and carrying the living with them. He thought of the many levels of the city. He thought of all the countless thousands that must inhabit them. He could hold them off in the shaft as long as he wished, if he had no other need for the sword. But he knew that as soon as he turned his back, they'd be upon him again. And if he should once fall, he could not spare a moment or a chance. He looked at Kyra, not knowing what to do. And it seemed to him that the sheathing of frost had melted, just a little, around her face. Desperately, he struck down again at the creatures in the shaft. And then the answer came to him. He dropped the sword. The squat round mechanism was beside him, with its broken crystal wheel. He picked it up. It was heavy. It would have been heavy for two men to lift. But Stark was a driven man. Grunting, swaying with the effort, he lifted it and let it fall, out and down. Like a thunderbolt, it struck among the slender bridges, the spider web of icy strands that spanned the shaft. Stark watched it go and listened to the brittle snapping of the ice, the final crashing of a million shards at the bottom far below. He smiled and turned to Kyra, picking up the sword. It was hours later. Stark walked across the glowing ice of the valley, toward the cairn. The sword of Ban Kruak hung at his side. He had taken the talisman and replaced it in the boss. He was himself again. Kyra and Balin walked beside him. The color had come back into their faces, but faintly, and they were still weak enough to be glad of Stark's hands to steady them. At the foot of the cairn they stopped, and Stark mounted it alone. He looked for a long moment into the face of Ban Kruak. Then he took the sword, and carefully turned the rings upon it, so that the radiation spread out as it had before, to close the gates of death. Almost reverently, he replaced the sword in Ban Kruak's hands. Then he turned and went down over the tumbled stones. The shimmering darkness brooded still over the distant tower. Underneath the ice, the elfin city still spread downward. The Shining Ones would rebuild their bridges in the shaft and go on as they had before, dreaming their cold dreams of ancient power. But they would not go out through the gates of death. Ban Kruak, in his rusty mail, was still lord of the pass, the warder of the Norlands. Stark said to the others, Tell the story in Kashad. Tell it through the Norlands. The story of Ban Kruak and why he guards the gates of death. Men have forgotten, and they should not forget. They went out of the valley then, the two men and the woman. They did not speak again, and the way out through the pass seemed endless. Some of Kyra's chieftains met them at the mouth of the pass above Kashat. They had waited there, ashamed to return to the city without her, but not daring to go back into the pass again. They had seen the creatures of the valley, and they were still afraid. They gave mounts to the three. They themselves walked behind Kyra, and their heads were low with shame. They came into Kashat through the Riven Gate, and Stark went with Kyra to the king's city 
for she made Balin follow too. Your sister is there, she said. I have had her cared for. The city was quiet, with the sullen apathy that follows after battle. The men of Mech cheered Kyra in the streets. She rode proudly, but Stark saw that her face was gaunt and strained. He, too, was marked deep by what he had seen and done beyond the gates of death. They went up into the castle. Thanis took Balin into her arms and wept. She had lost her first wild fury, and she could now look at Kyra with a restrained hatred that had a tinge almost of admiration. You fought for Kushat, she said, unwillingly, when she had heard the story. For that, at least, I can thank you. She went to Stark then, and looked up at him. Kushat and my brother's life. She kissed him, and there were tears on her lips. But she turned to Kyra with a bitter smile. No one can hold him, any more than the wind can be held. You will learn that. She went out then with Balin, and left Stark and Kyra alone in the chambers of the king. Kyra said, The little one is very shrewd. She unbuckled the hauberk and let it fall, standing slim in her tunic of black leather, and walked to the tall windows that looked out upon the mountains. She leaned her head wearily against the stone. Ah, oh, an evil day, an evil deed. And now I have Kushat to govern with no reward of power from beyond the gates of death. How man can be misled! Stark poured wine from the flagon and brought it to her. She looked at him over the rim of her cup, with a certain wry amusement. The little one is shrewd, and she is right. I don't know that I can be as wise as she. Will you stay with me, Stark? Or will you go? He did not answer at once. And she asked him, What hunger drives you, Stark? It is not conquest as it is with me. What are you looking for that you cannot find? He thought back across the years, back to the beginning, to the boy in Chaka, who had once been happy with old one and little Tika, in the blaze and thunder and bitter frosts of the valley and the twilight belt of mercury. He remembered how all that had ended under the guns of the miners, the men who were his own kind. He shook his head. I don't know. It doesn't matter. He took her between his hands, feeling the strength and splendor of her and it was oddly difficult to find words. I want to stay, Kyra. Now, this minute, I could promise that I would stay forever. But I know myself. You belong here. You will make Kushat your own. I don't. Someday, I will go. Kyra nodded. My neck also was not made for chains and one country was too little to hold me. Very well, Stark. Let it be so. She smiled and let the wine cup fall. This concludes Black Amazon of Mars by Lay Brackett. Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson. If you enjoyed this performance, please subscribe, leave a comment, or review. Thank you for listening.